Later today, Francis is expected to release his document answering the requests and concerns of the Amazon Synod. Its working English title is expected to be Dearest Amazon, which is a reassuring title because there is nothing I personally like to see more in papal documents than to anthropomorphize jungles and other geographic features of the earth. Two or three weeks ago, I did a video where I took the leaked Vatican memo that told the bishops what to expect out of the document, and went on to the cited source material to look at what the Vatican was telling us. Well, over the weekend, we had an interesting story emerge that further tells us what to expect, and quite frankly, it's not good. So let's look at the story because some interesting characters were invited to a meeting with Francis to coincide with the release of the document, and that meeting tells you everything you need to know about it. It was announced over the weekend that two figures were going to have an audience with Francis, probably today, the day the document called Caridia Amazonia, which I know I said wrong, but whose name translates roughly to Dearest Amazon. They are names you should know if you want to know what to expect from the document. I plan to have a video up on the document itself tomorrow. The men invited by Francis will have a personal audience with him are Lula da Silva and Leonardo Boff and some of you listening will know who they are. If not, let's go into this briefly, because these men are the poster children for liberation theology and eco-Marxism. As Francis himself said, there are no coincidences, especially with the happenings in his court. Let's start with the former president of Brazil, Lula da Silva. In 2017, da Silva was jailed on money laundering and corruption charges. He was sentenced to almost 10 years in jail, but was released recently by the country's Supreme Court, pending the appeals process going forward. While I can't speak of the veracity of the legal charges against him, I can give you an idea of the programs he pushes. He is the head of the Workers United Party in Brazil, a socialist political party that promotes all the typical Marxist programs. In 2018, he was the favorite to win the Brazilian presidential election, until he was jailed, which is credited at least in part to the victory of Jair Bolsonaro, though that reasoning may be propaganda of the American and British press. Speaking of the American press, as expected, they sing his praises and give him credit for an economic boom the country experienced during his first term in office, and they generally sing his praises while denouncing the current president of that country as an extremist. Why he is being permitted to leave Brazil while he his appeals in the courts go forward, I don't understand, but the audience is, or perhaps already he, had, he has had with Francis at this point, is happening in Rome. I'd go into his political program, but it's the typical socialist program of big government programs with lots of spending and that sort of thing. Leonardo Boff is the more interesting figure. He is one of the main minds behind the development and promulgation of liberation theology in South America. As his name suggests, he's ethnically German, and yes, he's a Franciscan. His real name, or was, his real name is Genesio Darcy Boff, and all his biographies online call him a Brazilian theologian. I'll just read you the biography that an, a radical environmental organization has on him. It's pretty rich. Quote, Leonardo Boff was born in Brazil in 1938, received a doctorate from Munich in Germany in 1970, and for the following 20 years was professor of theology at the Jesuit Institute for Philosophy and Theology in Petropolis. Since 1993, he has been a professor at the State University of Rio de Janeiro, where he is now emeritus professor of ethics, philosophy of religion, and ecology. He is also a member of the International Initiative of the Earth Charter. Boff was one of the founders of liberation theology. He was silenced by the Vatican in 1985, because of the criticism of the Catholic Church in his book, The Church, Charisma, and Power. In 1992, receiving a second silencing order, he left the Franciscan order of which he was a member, stating that the future of humanity and planet Earth are more important than the future of the institutionalized church. He is, however, still active as a lay priest in poor communities, who are now finding a vision of social justice and community in the Comunidades de Base, or Base Christian Communities. There are more than 100,000 of these grassroots Christian groups in Brazil, which attempt to fuse the teachings of Christ with a liberating social gospel. Boff believes these are the places where liberation theology is lived concretely, where the political dimensions of a liberating faith come into play, and where the poor can come to understand the poverty is not natural. The Comunidades de Bas continue to spawn leaders who work on behalf of the poor, 
in trade unions, political parties, and in community organizations. Boff has worked closely with the Brazilian Landless Movement, a 1991 Right Livelihood Award recipient. Boff's more recent work has sought to integrate ecology into liberation theology. His book, Cry of the Earth, Cry of the Poor, is a synthesis of deep ecology thinking with radical social critique. One chapter celebrates St. Francis of Assisi as the paradigm of the new covenant of the heart with all things, which is Boff's answer to the world's twin crises of poverty and ecological destruction. In 2009, The Tao of Liberation, an exploration of the ecology of transformation with Mark Hathaway, was released. Boff is the author of more than 70 books. End quote. You know, I sometimes like to read these things from the sources that support the person or cause in question, because most often they do all the work for you. Nothing there screams Catholic to me except his concern for the poor, and it all flies in the face of Catholic social teaching, especially the attacks on private property some of these groups represent. But the best part is the silenced by the Vatican twice bit. Why was Leonardo Boff silenced by the Vatican? Let's turn to the archive of the New York Times to get a report on this. Yes, the New York Times actually reported on some Franciscan in Brazil back in 1984, which should give you the idea of the level of influence Boff had internationally at that time. Quote, On Monday, the Vatican issued its fullest critique of liberation theology, crediting it with with restoring to a place of honor the great text of the prophets in defense of the poor, but strongly censuring the reliance of some advocates on the Marxist theory of class struggle. The statement was presented by Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, the prefect of the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, who will be interrogating Friar Boff, end quote. Okay, so what's the big deal? At the time, many priests and bishops who were influenced by Boff had positions of the governments of these countries, and they openly professed a Marxist ideology. Plus, a lot of the revolutionary movements in South America at the time had priests actually wielding weapons, which is under most such circumstances, horrifying. Numerous times the church has said you cannot be any variety of a Marxist and still be a Catholic. The rise of a so-called Christian socialism was first noted by Pius XI, largely due to the rise of Marxism in post-World War, or in pre-World War II Europe, rather. And as some commentators have noted before, that was at the same time that the roots of liberation theology were planted in South America by servants of Joseph Stalin. The work of Boff and these bishops had caused such confusion among the laity in South America since at the least the 1960s, if not earlier, that a formal Vatican response was needed, and they censured Boff twice in a ten-year period. Eventually, Boff would leave the Franciscan order to promote his weird theology, and now fittingly teaches at a university in Brazil. He's 81 years old, so seeing what must feel like the culmination of his life's work with the synod must be thrilling. The audience he is being granted with Francis should only be seen as another repudiation of John Paul II and Cardinal Ratzinger. I'd love to get Benedict XVI's feelings on this meeting, but, you know, that will probably never happen. Of course, liberation theology, the eco-Marxism it has spawned, is not limited to South America. Take a look at briefly at the statement from an American bishop. Quoting LifeSite News, The bishop of San Diego has made the case that climate change should be considered equally preeminent in Catholic social teaching, since the potential death toll due to man-made temperature rise is larger than um, legal Moloch worship and threatens the very future of humanity. End quote. That article goes on and on to outline his madness, but t- here's the meat of it. The b- bishop in question is Bishop McElroy of San Diego, who categorically rejected the traditional view of Catholics and our duties in a democracy. He goes on to push a wicked idea that Moloch worship and climate change are on equal footing, which is a weird take for me to try to wrap my head around. But the idea is frankly predictable, and it's rooted in the thinking of the men like Boff, who, despite their ideas being condemned, were taught widely at Catholic universities and seminaries in the U.S. and across the West, and due in large part to the corruption of Catholic universities, from the Land of Lake statement being signed by the men running Notre Dame, Lord Notre Dame, in the aftermath of the Second Vatican Council. That is a video I plan to do in the future, so keep an eye on that for those wondering why Catholic universities are no longer Catholic except in name. Today, we should find out what the document says that Francis is releasing. I'll go under the record to say that we can expect more of the UN's sustainable program couched in the terminology of liberation theology, meaning talk of social justice and colonialism and that sort of thing. Basically, think Laudato C2. But let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Check in with me tomorrow for the initial review of the work itself. This will probably take a few days to go over, though. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm Anthony Stein. 
Ave Maria.